Thank you. I appreciate that introduction. I am Heather Thormalen Mullick. I am a proud SFA alum. I did, I am a, a lumberjack under the proud tutelage of Dr. Dave Creech and Greg Grant. Went to school along with Don Stover, so I'm very glad to be here. We are gardeners. We are horticulturists. We are crazy plant people, are we not? <laughs> and we are blessed with a love of nature and the outdoors. We are imaginative. We are artistic. We paint with flowers and we draw with trees. And in doing that, we appreciate everything that we find, um, whether we're in our own SFA garden, the piney woods of East Texas, the hill country, anywhere across the United States or even across Texas or across the United States. We appreciate what we see and we find it. And if you guys are anything like me, you gather it and bring it home. And so tonight I'm going to tell you a little bit of what you can do with these interesting, unique items that you find and you bring home. So before we get into the wreath making itself, I wanted to talk to you guys a little bit about supplies. These are basic supplies that you're going to need for any of the items that you do, whether it's a wreath, garland, even decorations for your kitchen counter. You're going to need some of these supplies. Of course, you're going to need your handy dandy shears. I like Felco or Coronas, you know. That was instilled in me by this man back here in the back corner. Oh my gosh. <laughs> you want your pair of scissors, pliers, needle nose are best because you're going to be working with little fine pieces of wire. You want to get in there and be able to utilize that in the small nooks and crannies. Um, <clears throat> paddle wire. <clears throat> Excuse me. Paddle wire is shaped like this. When you go to the hobby store, you will often find it in large rolls like this. Don't buy this one. This is a piece of junk. These are horrible. You really want the true paddle wire. It just rolls off your hands so much easier and is easy to use as you're weaving through branches and plant material and things like that. So that's a, a little user's tip for you guys on that. Um, I do suggest 24 gauge. Wire comes in gauges. The higher the gauge is, actually, the smaller the wire is. 24 is kind of medium as to what you'll want to use for most things. Um, Greening pins, glue gun, glue sticks, ribbon. You're going to need your wreath form. Your wreath base, you have 10 million options. You can make your own. These here on this side, I made, and I'm going to show you how to do that. The ones over here on this side have been bought at hobby stores. They do have grapevine wreaths as well, but you can tell that they're machine made. They're beautiful, but they're not as individualistic. I'll show you how you can make your own. You have options for different wire colors, for things that, that suit your needs as you're going through. Um, loppers, wire stem, floral tape, those are some of the things that you need. These are the basics. This is what I use almost every time other than the floral tape. I don't really use that very often, but it was there, so I took a picture of it. Oops. Hmm. There we go. All right. Again, the wreath in the back upper corner is a store-made one. On the right side, that is a wreath that I made myself out of grapevine. You have your wired wreath base, straw base, and foam bases, all for different purposes. And all very easy to use. Don't let it be intimidating to you. They're all very easy. Different options that you can find at your lo local craft store, including the twig wreaths, which I'm so glad to see someone has already done. Certain varieties of them here, they're beautiful easy to use. When you're doing a wreath like that, you want to make sure you get branches all of the same size. That's kind of a, a user's tip on that. Same size gives you a beautiful wreath in the end. Whoops. Getting a little crazy with it. Dawn was right about the touchiness. Yeah. <laughs> uh, different varieties of ribbon. You can buy your own or you can go and raid your decorators, you know, your wrapping kit at your own house and get the different types of ribbon. I do suggest the ribbon with wire because it holds up nicely as you make your bow um, or the grow grain ribbon. Those are often really good for uh, floral designs and, and things of that nature. We go through, like I said, when we go, we're out and about, we see the beauty in everything. And so when you're out, collect what you find, whether it's pine cones, the male cones, Acacia seeds, collect what you find and take it home. There is a, there's 
thing that I found over the years that's best for wreath making is when you find pods and seeds that are very woody. The more woody they are, the longer they last for you in arrangements and on wreaths. Everything that's natural will decay over time, of course, but if you find ones that are a little bit more sturdy, those last longer for you and hold up better. So here you have the, um, a lily pod, the Eugenia, yucca seed pods. You can use flowers and dry them yourselves, hang them upside down, put them in glycerin, different things like that. There's many different types of flowers that dry well, including here I've shown yarrow, sage, and different varieties of thistle. Of course, roses and all kinds of things dry very well. This is a collection of different seed pods that I have got over the, over the time frame. These were all collected in basically a day's period of time. At the front, you have Vitex, the Agnes Castus seed pods at the front, magnolia cones, pine cones, different varieties of oak acorns. If you compare oak acorns, they're all different. You have some that are really long and skinny, like the cambii. You have little bitty short fat ones, like the water oaks. They're all different shapes, different sizes. And so they're really neat when you collect in mass from different tree species and you can wire those up for beautiful garland. It's really neat. Red is a little bit hard to find for, your, for natural berries because holly, even though you think of it as Christmas all the time, it doesn't hold up well without water. So for wreaths, garland, it doesn't do well. Some good options for you are sumac, the different varieties, shining sumac, uh, flame leaf sumac, Different ones have the red berries at the lower right here for you guys. Again, that's Vitex. The upper right is the Western Soap Berry, Black Walnut Seed, uh, the Texas Buckeye. <laughs> you can use all different types of cones, whether it's Love in a Mist, the Cups of Burr Oak, the lovely little sweet gum balls that most people hate, but I think they're beautiful. If you take those and you make an arrangement with them, they're absolutely gorgeous. Don't just think, on them, think about it as what you step on in the yard. Think, look at their shape, they're gorgeous. <laughs> and again, there's the, the sumac in the, in the bottom there. You can use everything. It's not just to eat. They're also beautiful when you look at them. Pay attention to what we have out there that is just given to us from the beautiful plants that we create in our gardens. It's absolutely gorgeous. Acorn caps, cotton. Most people don't think of cotton as being something that you can use on wreaths or anything like that, but you can use this as just an accent as you would along the side here. Or if you pick pieces, stems of cotton while those bowls are still tight and green, make your wreath with it. Then as it dries, those bowls open and they intermix and you have a full cotton wreath. Really neat. Texas Mountain Laurel, you can use the pods and you can also use the seeds. This is another good option for red in your arrangements that holds up very, very well. You can use it for garland, you can hot glue it onto wreath arrangements. Again, the Texas Buckeye. You can use both the pods and the seed. Great native plant, as you all know. Um, eight to 10 foot tall, does well, and gives you year round interest, plus interest in your decorating. Take advantage of help when you can get it. <laughs> this is Western Soap Berry. That's what I have on this wreath right here. It holds up very well without water. Um, and I will show you guys later how well it holds. Um, I've had some berries that I collected this time last year and they're still holding onto the stems. So it's a really good one to use. Oh, there we go. I've stuck in a picture of it right there. See, the, they're a little blacker on the right-hand side there but that's still, they still have a beautiful opalescent look to them. They're a little more black, but they still hold on to the, to the stem. So it's, again, if you wanted to keep your wreath for another year, you could do that as well. We are blessed here in the Piney Woods. You have access to pine cones galore. And here we have four different species. You have the longleaf, you have the slash, you have loblolly, and you have shortleaf. So you have four different sizes of pine cones that you can go and get right there for different arrangements and garland. You can do all different types of things with it. You can paint it. You can use wire or twine to attach it to garlands and wreaths. 
Um, you can put it on picks. You can hot glue little picks onto the end of it and use it in floral arrangements. Sumac, again, I know I've said this before, but this is great for um, color for your wreaths and arrangements. This is a year old. I picked these last year, right after I talked to Dr. Creech and learned that I was gonna be doing this talk. I was worried that they wouldn't, wouldn't be any ripe for this time of year. I was wrong, there are, but these are last year's and they're still beautiful. Chinka pin oak, again, the acorns, plus you can utilize the leaves if you wanted to do a leaf arrangement. They dry into that beautiful goldish tan coloration and they hold onto the stems well. So again, when you cut that stem and you use that to make your wreaths, they, they stay on there, they don't dehiss, and so you have a good wreath, leaf, wreath arrangement. Olive branches, all varieties of juniper, whether it's our Eastern Red, any of the introduced landscape varieties, anything, you can use that for your wreath greenery. Um, plus you have the added interest of the little blue cones that are on there, and also you have the uh, male cones with the pollen, which makes us all sneeze, but when you get those with the male pollen, pollen cones on there, they're a bright yellow coloration, and they give you that added pop when you're doing a greenery arrangement. And then you have things like eucalyptus. If you go to California, I've been known to bring eucalyptus back in my suitcase almost every time I go. <laughs> uh, this is another option for a different coloration for your wreaths. This is icy blue. Um, Cupressus, and again, you have those added interest of the cones on the greenery if you get it at the right time of year. You can use things like taxis or, or cephalotaxis that's over here on the left, um, thuja in the center, and even sycamore leaves make beautiful wreath arrangements. It doesn't take very much of any of this to make arrangement. You may think, oh, I, I don't have access to any of that. Yeah, you do. You know, Dawn and, and Dr. Creech aren't gonna notice if you go over there to one of those magnolias <laughs> and you take a few leaves off of the bottom of one of them, out of the inside, they're not gonna notice. It really doesn't take very many leaves at all to do this. <laughs> they won't mind if you pick up a few pine cones. <laughs> uh, so here we talk about the, the magnolias. You have the magnolia cone, you have the magnolia leaves, and both of those are beautiful in wreaths. Um, you can do beautiful table arrangement with the leaves with pine cones out the center of them and just so many different options with those. And they also dry a beautiful tan coloration with the gold back. Other greenery, you can use lavender, rosemary, and even our very own native um, wax myrtle. All of these are fragrant. They dry well, keep their coloration for the most part and you have that fragrance as the wreath hangs in your, in your house, even after it's dry. When I was at school, I don't know if Dr. Creech knows this, but when I was, I was at school, when, one winter break, I went over to the herb garden, picked enough, like I said, it really doesn't take very much, picked enough, yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> I made a wreath out of uh, rosemary and gave it as a gift one year. It was just, it, uh, no, <laughs> I was just pruning, I was just helping. You know, we have to go out there and prune anyway, right? So I was, I was just helping. Of course, you can use your traditional things that people think for greenery for wreaths as well. When it gets closer to Christmas, you think of spruce, you think of Douglas fir, you think of all of these things. Um, and keep in mind that when you go to get your Christmas tree, they always cut off the lower branches for you, right? Because nobody wants that, you have to stick it in your in your base, so they cut off all those lower branches. Most of them will just give you branches for free, and you can make arrangements with that for Christmas. You can also buy it if you go to a floral supply store or something like that, you could buy big boxes of it. But most of us, like I said, you don't need very much. So if you just ask when you go and get your Christmas tree and help support the industry by buying your live tree, then you can also get your greenery as well. So, we're moving on, we're going on to how do we make the darn thing? When you make your grapevine wreath, first of all, you wanna start out by wearing the right shoes. These are not the right shoes. You wanna to wear toes, closed toe shoes or something like that because it's gonna take a little bit of effort to get that grapevine out of the tree. Plus, you're gonna be walking through the weeds and grass and stuff like that because grapevine grows in fence rows, next railroad tracks, 
up telephone poles, things like that. So be ready. Know what grapevine looks like. Know what poison ivy looks like, greenbrier, et cetera. Because they all kind of grow intermixed along with trumpet vine and pepperberry and all these kinds of things. So know what you're getting into before you go pulling on it. Because eh, that could be bad for you. You want to find a spot that doesn't have it. Also, be aware that they grow up telephone lines or are on um, electrical wires. Don't pull it off of that because you don't want to pull the, the wire down because grapevine tends to hold on. This is grapevine. This is not. That's poison ivy. This is grapevine. This is greenbrier. Thorns. <laughs> and also, it doesn't do very well because when it dies, it's very brittle. Grapevine holds its form and is still fairly flexible. So you can experiment with other varieties of vines, but don't try with those two for sure. <laughs> Select your spot. These are good spots because they're away from everything else. They're away from the poison ivy that's in the back where the trees are planted. Um, this one was really awesome on the right-hand side here because even though that looks like an electrical line it was on, it wasn't. There probably was one to begin with that got it started, but that's a big grapevine wreath going vine going across the top and then all the little branches hanging down. That one was perfect. How do you do this? You go out there and you're ready to work because you're going to have to pull because they all have tendrils and these little bitty tendrils turn into that big woody tendril and they're holding on to the branches for dear life of the trees because their, their job is to stay up where the sunlight is. So you're going to have to get ready to pull. That eh, may not work. Well, a video of my husband and I pulling grapevine out of the trees. <laughs> and success at the end when we get it. So, um, whoops. Okay. So this is the cluster of, of grapevine branches that we pulled. We used loppers, cut off the big pieces, pulled it out of the trees, took it home. Now what do you do with it? Now you get ready to start weaving it together. And I really hope this works. And now it was working a second ago, and now it won't. Ideas? I don't think there's anything to do. Okay. Is it Wi-Fi or is it off the... No, it's off the phone drive, so it might be too graphic intensive. All right, well, sorry about that, you guys. This is a video of me going through, when you get your big cluster of grapevine home, you want to go through, you want to spread it out, because it's going to be a tangled mess. So you want to spread it out, untangle it first, so you want to stretch it from end to end, all the little branches and everything off to one side. You want to separate all the different pieces. I probably cut four or five for this demonstration. So you want to separate them all out, get all the little branches separated out. Once you do that, you want to go through and you want to cut off the greenery. Like I said, when you find a, a store-made one, sometimes you'll see the leaves still stuck in there because it's done with a machine and they just cram it all in there and tie it up tight. I've tried it on mine before. Personally, I don't like the way it looks. So I go through and I take off all the leaves. I take off all the green branches, that's the ends of the grapevine, because that doesn't do well at the end. It's too soft, it's too succulent, just like with propagation, you don't want to use your real green, fleshy, succulent stuff for propagation. You don't want to use it for this either, because when it dries, it breaks really easily. So you want to cut all of that off, not use it. And then once you get started, you want to know about the size that you're going to want, where you want your grapevine wreath. Are you going to want it on your front door? If so, you don't want a huge one. You're going to want a smaller wreath. If you want it on your garage, maybe you want a larger one, something like that. So you choose your size, get your end, make a circular shape out of it. It's not going to be per perfectly circular, so you're going to have to squish it, and you'll hear it cracking. As you, as you use your hands and push it against your body, you, you crack it and get it into the shape you want. You have to keep holding the two ends where they cross over. While you go to the other end, grab all your branches that are over here, and you weave them through the center. I leave on the tendrils. I don't cut them off. When I first started, when my mom first taught me how to do these, we cut off the tendrils because it makes it easier to weave it through when it's got not getting stuck on each other. But I think they're beautiful, and I leave them on now. I don't cut them all off, so you could go either way. But you weave that through. You pull it through, and you keep weaving and pulling it through until eventually, after two or three wraps, your first part where you started kind of holds itself, and then you can keep going. 
You weave until you get to one of the little side branches. Again, it's easier if you cut the side branches off and you just have a straight piece. But I like it to where you have the little bins and the little nooks and crannies. I think it adds interest, so I leave them all on there. So when I get to a little side branch, I stop with my main piece, work on the side branch, and weave it through until I get to the end. Tuck the end into the center here. You want to tuck it in underneath and secure it in place, and then continue on with your main branches until you do that through all the way through. If it's not thick enough for you, get a second piece. Get your end, weave it amongst this middle part here, and just keep going, weaving it in until it's thicker and thicker until you get it to the shape you want. Again, don't be afraid to squish it, make it the shape you want, make it however you want. It's not gonna, it's not gonna break it. Oh, look it. Well, good grief, never mind. <laughs> so, out of that that you saw there in the yard, this is what we made from it. And like I said, don't be afraid to pull on it. This was this piece right here. I had it on my foot and I was literally pulling to get it the shape I wanted because at first it was not pretty at all. So put it on my foot, pull to turn, pull, get it however you want. And on thick pieces like this, you can use baling wire, use your pliers, twist it together. Be sure to wrap those ends under so they don't, you don't cut yourself on them later. So now that you have your base, we're gonna get started on wreath making, right? This is a beautiful scene out of New Mexico that I saw one day, and it's just a, looks like Christmas, doesn't it? <laughs> For wreaths, paddle wire is essential. This is gonna be your friend. Like I said, uh, 24 gauge is kind of the, the standard, that's what I use. For those, making your hanger, this is off of a store-bought straw wreath, of course, but it's a good demonstration. You want to get an end of it, wrap it around to the other side. Don't cut your wire. Use your paddle wire, wrap it around to the other side, twist it together. Wrap several times until you get wire that you think is thick enough to hold the type of wreath you're going to make. Cut off your wire, twist the ends together again so that it's one solid piece. Twist the main bundle, and there you have your hanger. For this wreath here in the front, the Western Soapberry, this is all I used. I just used the grapevine wreath base that I built. You saw me describe how I built it. Um, Western Soapberry seed, which is ripe this time of year. Um, this yellow translucent seed pod that is absolutely gorgeous, pine cones, and paddle wire. I used the copper colored paddle wire because it would match well with the berries that I was using. To do this, you want to gather a group of berries, put them together into a cluster that pleases you. See how far up the side of the wreath you want to do. Usually you don't want to do halfway. Halfway doesn't really look good. It's not, it's not aesthetically pleasing. So in thirds often is, is the goal. Find where you like it. Wrap the end of your paddle wire around one of the branches of the grapevine wreath several times so that it ties it and then start wrapping it around your bundle and around the grapevine itself. You're gonna pull it tight, and once you pull it tight with that paddle wire, the paddle wire just rolls nicely through your fingers because it fits well nicely in your hand. Um, after you pull it tight, you can even lay it down, get your next bundle together, attach it, pick up the paddle wire again, give it a little tug before you get started just to make sure it's still nice and tight, add your other clusters as you go down. I do not cut the stems until the very end because all of that stem length on there gives you more wire wrap around it as you go down and you have more secure bunches of berries or greenery or whatever you're, you're adding to it. Here I was just showing that I use that paddle wire and use it as a needle through and amongst the, the berries themselves and amongst the, the grapevine to get it tight and where I want it to be. That is last year's berries of the Western Soap Berry. Not as beautiful as they were to begin with this year, but still very nice, just gives you a different look, a different layer of texture to your wreaths. So what I did then is I wanted to add some um, longleaf pine and some loblolly pine cones. So cut off a length of wire, 
get it longer than you think you're going to need because you're probably gonna have to wrap it several times. You put it in amongst the, the scales of the pine cone, down as tight as you can, and make as much of a knot and twist it as much as you can so that that pine cone stays in place amongst the wire. Then take the wire and start attaching it to your grapevine. You might have to use a couple different pieces because sometimes, especially the big ones, fall, like unfortunately this guy did. We were trying to fix it outside on the way in here. But that's an easy, easy and beautiful wreath that you can use. And the wonderful thing about these is the grapevine wreaths themselves, you can take all the material off of it and still keep that and utilize it. I also think they're beautiful just stacked together as an arrangement on their own. You can use straw base for natural wreath arrangements. These are natural leaves. These have just been um, glycerinized, if that's a word, uh, so that they're still soft and flexible. You take that and greening pins on your straw base, get a cluster of leaves, and pin them. Pretty darn easy. <laughs> um, you want to splay the leaves out a little bit so they get as much coverage as you can. You want to make sure you cover the tops, the sides, and the inside, the three sides of your straw wreath. When you do your next layer, you're going to still continue to grab your bundles and work your way down, and you're covering up the pin of the ones you did prior with the new group of tips of leaves that you put on. You're gonna continue working until you get all the way around towards the end. When you get to this little bitty chunk left here, you're gonna look at that and you're gonna think, okay, now what? You push the leaves back from the, the little groups that you first put on, push them back out of the way, stick in your, the petioles of the remaining leaves, pin them in place and cover it up, and they're gonna be all set. Now, I did make a mistake with this wreath. I made it too small. For the size of the leaves, for the side of shoebard leaves, I should have made a bigger wreath, so you would have, it would have looked more proportionate. So that's my tip to you if you guys decide to do this. Consider the size of your leaves and how far they're gonna stick out to the side and do a bigger wreath, and it would probably look better than that one did. You can still do the same thing with natural shoebard leaves off the tree. These leaves are grape leaves. And I think this turned out really well. And I was able to keep this wreath that I did for, and use it for two falls. It stayed really, really well. So grape leaves are a good option for you to use. Um, I just used it like this. You could add more to it. You could add all your pine cones and, and ribbon and, and things like that. But I used it like this. And the final one that I was going to show you guys was a magnolia wreath. I think they're beautiful when they're brown as well as when they're green. And if you do a green one, then it slowly fades, and then you have the, the golden tan coloration at the end as well. Moving on to garland. Garland is pretty easy. It doesn't have to be anything big and elaborate. Uh, this is Lady Banks Rose. Lady Banks Rose in flower. And they dry well. You can still have that yellow coloration on there. Uh, there's two to three stems, long arching stems on each side. They're attached in the center with wire. And then uh, they have, as their bow in the center, they have like, it was prob probably a Virgin of the Guadalupe or, or something like that. This was a, a doorway that I saw in New Mexico and I just thought it was absolutely gorgeous. This is another one. I made this with Blue Pacific Juniper. It has long arching branches on it that is, is good for ground covers. Well, it's also a beautiful blue, spiny, star-shaped leaf. And so I took several of those, arching in different directions. Again, tied them in the center with wire, put my bow across the center, and added um, possum haw berries as an accent. Possum haw hold up a little bit better than some of the other pollies do, but still they're not great. It's kind of a short-term solution. But overall, a very pretty garland that you can use and make very fast. Piney woods, again, we have all these pine cones. Utilize them, it's easy, it's fun, <laughs> they're gorgeous. Um, to make them, you can do several different things. You can get uh, little screw eyes. If you want to, you can paint your pine cones different colors, you can paint them silver, you can paint them gold, or you can leave them natural. I think they're beautiful natural. Screw it into the end using your pliers. Take your twine, knot it. At, no, let me, let me start over, you guys. 
Measure the area you want first. If you want it across your, your banister, measure your area first, allow for your swag, and add a foot or two on either side for your trailing tails. Then go to the center of your catcher twine or rope, whatever you're gonna put it on, go to the center, make that your center point, and start spacing it out evenly from there. When you start at the center, in order to keep this in place with your little eye hook, you're gonna tie a knot in the twine above it, then move out three or four inches, whatever you decide you wanna do, put your next one, tie another little knot in that, and continue on. <clears throat> You can do it different ways. On the right, this is just red twine that's been wrapped around short leaf pine cones. And they dipped each of those pine cones into white paint. Just put white paint in a little paper plate. Dip your pine cones. It's kind of tedious, but looks pretty in the end. <laughs> and they wrapped red twine around it. And that's beautiful across the mantle. You can also just take wire and wrap it around your pine cones and, and then wrap the other end around your ribbon. So for your indoor-outdoor decor, what situation are you wanting? Are you wanting something formal? Is it semi-formal? Is it going to go inside? Is it going to go outside? Find your container. That's the biggest thing for these, these arrangements. Find your container. Gather your supplies. Your containers can be anything. These are, these are things that you can find at flea markets, antique stores, garden centers. You have hanging containers. Now they have all these little terrariums that you can find. They're all the range right now, and they're beautiful. They're really interesting. Um, you can find things at your craft stores, crates and barrels and buckets and galvanized items and glass things and all kinds of different things. Or you can raid your own house and find the things that you have stored underneath cabinets that you've liked over the years, or, as I said, when we're out gathering, you can also find unique pieces of wood. Find it before it finds you, gather it, <laughs> bring it home, and you can use things like succulents. Succulents are all the rage. They're really easy to grow. All you do with these is you take off a little leaf, and that roots. It takes time, takes patience, but you can do it. Or you can find little offsets, or like me on the right-hand side there, you can find big, huge pieces of cuttings if you're at the right nursery. And this is their trash. Take those home, root them yourself, and make your own containers. You can buy containers. You can make your own containers. Succulents are really good because they can take bright indoor light, which is really pretty low light compared to outside. But they can take indoor conditions for quite a period of time if you don't overwater. They don't need a whole lot of water when they're inside. They really don't outside either. But when they're inside, maybe water them once every two weeks and only water very lightly. Take your tips from nature. Make your own Tillandsia wreath looking like this. We, we found this in, in central Texas. as a yucca growing inside the cavity of an old tree root. Make your own Tillandsia hanging in your yard. With those wood pieces that you find, Find those little nooks and crannies in there, get some well-draining potting soil, fill them up, stick in your cuttings, put sphagnum moss over the top so that it holds in the soil and the water and doesn't wash out every time you water them. Let them root and you have beautiful arrangements. Find your container and plant it. An old doll head works quite nicely. <laughs> It, your containers can be anything. They can be um, elegant. They can be whimsical. Or for your interior ones, they can uh, just use found materials again. This bottle is a bottle that I think had some chai tea or something in it that I thought was very pretty. Utilized it with, um, with some seed pods that I found there. And the name is avoid, suddenly escaped me. Hick Dr. Creech, what is the name of that? Hectia. Hectia seed pods are what I have in there, a native bromeliad of West Texas. And then I also have uh, utilized uh, eucalyptus seed pods that I gathered from California. This is how I have it arranged in our house. You can also do things like for, sometimes you just need a small arrangement on a table. So that's the small wreath that I made in the background, glass container, candle, 
and you can glue there in the front. I have two Baroque that I hot glued onto the wreath. You could cover the entire wreath in Baroque acorns if you wanted or just do a little accent like I did here. Put in your candles, surround it with acorns and mountain laurel seed and a few of the magnolia, small immature magnolia pod cones on the other side. Accent it with a slab of ash. You have a beautiful arrangement. Other things that you can do with things that are, are just in my house at least, because like I said, I, I love pine cones. Um, beautiful little container. I have sugar cone, the huge one is a, a sugar pine cone. Spruce fir cones in the basket. Then I have rocks again that I found. Those are calcite crystals that I found at Marble Falls. And then the little spiky thing in the front is a very woody, it doesn't look like what I'm about to tell you it is at all, but that is the flower bud of a eucalyptus. Very woody, very spiky. It looks like something out of this world, but that is what that is. Again, was going to make something with the Western Soapberry seed pod. Find your container. This container is one that was handmade by my mother, Susan. And uh, when she was making that, she pressed different leaves and cones and grapes into the side of it. So that also adds to that texture for me. Use foam. Again, you don't have to have water in this container for this one that I have because they, these dry very well on their own. They don't need water. Make sure that when you're doing your arrangements, you make them tall enough. A lot of people don't make them tall enough. You want to make sure that the top part is at least as tall, if not taller, than your container is, just for height and visual, visual appeal. You want to do things in groups of three, so you have your container, put a wreath behind it, put a piece of, I think that's pecan wood underneath. There you go, beautiful. There's my husband's addition to the arrangement. That was dinner as, as I was doing all of this, getting ready for this presentation. Or you can take and add dried branches to it as well. Um, this is the winged branches of cedar elm. And you can take and add it and it gives it a whole different look. Final thoughts, gather what makes you happy. There are endless possibilities of things to do with it. Gather what makes you happy. Thank you so much for having me here, and I'd be glad to answer any questions. <laughs>
So at the, she turned it upside down, and at the bottom she used it as her form for large wreaths, and up smaller, she made smaller wreaths with it. That's perfect. Yes, ma'am? I have a question. Uh, the shoe mark oak that you used was green. Yes. How long will it stay green? Several weeks. It starts to fade. It changes color from, you know, your bright, nice dark green to darker greens like this man's shirt here, and, and then fades to kind of a tannish color, and that's what you remain with is a, is a tan coloration at the end. So you do... Does it stay green? Several weeks, it does. Yeah, juniper stays green even when it's fully dry. It's still kind of a, um, kind of that color green. Thank you for wearing that shirt, sir. <laughs> I have one other question that you have to have an answer. When I have tried to cut sassafras branches to use in the house, they wilt. Hmm. Do you know anything about cutting Sassafras and bring it in the house. It's so cute. It's beautiful. I love sassafras. I love the way it smells. I have never tried that. Sometimes a good idea is to smash the ends of some of the things so that they get more water uptake in it. It always seems kind of counterintuitive to me, but that might be something that you try of just cutting it and they, they will try it away. So you might try smashing the ends and putting it in warm water to see if it can uptake more water to begin with when you first take it in the house so that it won't wilt as well, as fast, excuse me. <laughs> well, I'm not familiar with glycerin, so would glycerin prevent all of that from happening, from it changing colors, and is it powder or liquid, glycerin? Liquid. Okay. Liquid. So you dip everything in there, would it kill the bugs? <clears throat> no, the glycerin has to be taken up, so you have to cut fresh branches. Oh, I see. Fresh branches, there's a formula on the back of the containers that you buy, you dilute it with, uh, I think it's like one part to two parts water or something like that. You make it warm and you do smash the ends of your branches that you're wanting to um, preserve with glycerin and then you let it sit in a cool, dry, dark place for a couple of weeks. Yes. I, they were still on the branches? And then they were, and then they were pulled off. Yep. Yes, magnolia leaves. Do, you've done them with glycerin. Nice. Now, did you just do the leaves, or did you do them on the stem? On the stem. Perfect. Very nice. Good to know. I figured they would, but I've never done it myself. <laughs> Thank you. Hi. Grapevine leaves, I just did as they were. I didn't do anything to them. You know how they have that, uh, our native grapes, what's it called, Dawn? They have the, the fur on the back. I don't know the technical term of it, but it has this real stretchy, fibrous material on the back of the leaves, and that just holds them together naturally. No, the grapevine leaves, I just used them and pinned them on there, and like I said, I used that for two falls, and it was fine. Anybody else? Well, again, thank you so much for having me. Appreciate it. <laughs>